Do I look receding? Probably. Hi guys, so welcome to the Tatum Family YouTube channel. Um, I am Tom. I'm Rhys. And our baby Hugo is currently not here um, because he'd be making far too much noise and we wouldn't be able to answer this Q&A for you guys. We put a question box on our Instagram and we said to you guys just to fire some questions at us to kickstart our YouTube channel because I think it'd be great for people to get to know us on this platform as Definitely. well. I'm gonna get into that now. Right, so I think a good one to start with is how did you guys get together slash how did you meet? So we met on Instagram to begin with. Um, Reese slid into my DMs. <laughs> Basically, so I'm a hairdresser and I was working in a salon and I had dyed my hair and they told me I was not allowed to do that. Um, so I quit and then decided to dye my hair even further. And I posted a picture of it on Instagram. Which I saw and I yeah. messaged and said, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. So, so I had like the nicest, longest, like dark black hair. And I was like, I was obsessed anyway. So as soon as you, I saw you putting bleach on that, I was like, what are you doing? But now you're obsessed with when I like I do. scalp I bleach my I hair. I love it you when you're white. absolutely love it when, you, when I like bleach my hair. Yeah, so Reese messaged me that and I thought, cheek of it. So of course I replied. And I said, I'm doing like what I want to do. Um, and Reese said, listen, you're dyeing your hair, there's probably something more deep-rooted going on here. Do you want to talk to me about it? So, um, Reese said, can I add you on Snapchat? And I thought, hey, we're 18 <laughs> years old, I know what's going on here. Um, but yeah, no, he just wanted to talk about life problems. Of which I thought, yeah, fine, I'm, I can roll with this. So we spoke about my life problems. And I think it was just your life problems. <laughs> yeah, it was no one else's life problems. I think it was just voice note after voice note of, what what's wrong? What's yeah, what was going, going on, on? And why I quit my job, what was going on in life, la 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 la. And considering we'd never spoken before, like... Yeah. That was... I must have felt comfortable. And so then that happened and Reese went, oh, it'll get better. And that was pretty much well, it. It did. So yeah, that was pretty much it. And then we got into... Uh, we were talking on and off for about two weeks. I went out on a night out in London and you went on, out, on a night out in Manchester and I was severely hungover. Um, and I think you were probably hungover as well. I was definitely hungover. Reese messaged me and said, I saw you were out in London last night. Do you, like, do you wanna come and meet me? Like, shall we do something? Um, and I thought, absolutely no way. I am hungover, I am tired, I'm exhausted. I don't want to go into London. And plus, you hadn't given me much attention over those two weeks. Did so you give me some attention? You gave me some attention, but you didn't give me enough to warrant me traveling into London when I was hungover. I ended up going uh, because my mum told me just to get my backside up and get out of the house. So I went to go and meet you, but I didn't tell you I was coming. Um, mm. And I just turned up on the platform thinking I'll be really, really romantic. And um, Reese walked straight past me because <laughs> I was a massive catfish at the time. I ended up getting your attention and we walked around London together for about three or four hours. Yeah. We went to like all the lovely places that you can go in London. Like we went to go and see Buckingham Palace at night. We saw the London Eye. We walked down Oxford Street and because it was January, like all the Christmassy lights were still up. Yeah. Um, and it was just all really pretty and lovely. And then you almost missed your last train home. Yeah, we had to run to St Pancras. Yeah, so that was fun. The next weekend and the weekend after that and the weekend after that and the weekend after that, we just spent all the time together and then we've been together since. Yeah. So that was January 2015. So it's almost been eight years now. Eight years. That's mad. Wild, isn't it? Does it feel like eight years? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a good one to follow on from the last one. How long after you first met did you know you were in love and you wanted to spend your life together? I think we knew on the first night that we met. Mm. I think that it's something inside of you. I think you just feel like I don't know, that person, you just feel comfortable with that person. Just felt you feel easy. so cliche, but it does feel like it's the one. Like, I, yeah. You just get a feeling, don't you? 100%. I um, think I went home and I called uh, my friend. Um, and I was like, I've just been on a date. And she was like, oh yeah, how was it? And I was like, I think I'm going to marry him. And she was like, sorry? But I, I don't know what it was, but it just, we had a laugh. It felt comfortable. We just talked for four hours. 
Um, I did let you speak for some of that, maybe 20 yeah. minutes. We're still working yeah, on that. Yeah, still working on that, as you'll probably see throughout this. It just felt easy and natural, and I think we had the same family values, the same morals, the same... Definitely. Like, we just wanted the same things out of life, and I think it just fitted and it worked. Mm. So this says, childhood and teenage years, what were they like, and what were your hobbies and interests? It Childhood years were very, very different to your childhood years. Yeah. Mine were filled with a lot of sports. And I mean, you wouldn't think it now, Sorry. but it was. Very different to me. <laughs> really? You had a lot of uh, dancing, a lot yeah. of acting. Um, <laughs> mine was like full of was sport. It was yeah. just full of sport. Obviously, I lived down by the seaside, whereas yeah. obviously you you lived more inland, so... More inland? inland. That's the biggest thing what, to what say. Was, what, you live more like... I live north say? of London in a countryside, like inland. Oh, so it's countryside. It is a countryside. I'm surrounded by fields and farm animals. Okay. It was just really different. It was just yeah. really different. I think, like, you really enjoyed school. And you really had yeah, a lovely I did experience school. with school and friendship and friends and all that sort of stuff. And, like, I enjoyed school to a degree, but I also got a lot of... Um, trauma from school, um, which shaped me into the person I am today. Um, but do you know what I mean? I just think like my school experience wasn't the best of school experiences yeah. and the school I went to didn't handle um, the bullying that I encountered very well or anything like that. It just wasn't very well looked after and no. managed. Uh, but at the end of the day, I do feel like I'm glad I went through the school experience I did go through because I think it made me mature quicker and it made me stronger and it made me realise what I wanted from life. Hobbies and interests, I mean, I just danced and sing, singed? I danced and sung and acted and I was in pantos and I took part in Champions of the World for ballroom and Latin dancing. Didn't win, but that's fine. My outside of school life was a lot more enjoyable and fun and I could be who I wanted to be outside of school, whereas um, yeah. in school it wasn't my favourite experience. So, this one says, have you always been gay or did you discover it later in life? I was speaking about this the other day actually and I said, I think I knew from a very, very young age. Mm. I, didn't, I don't think I put two and two together. Well, I said the other day that I thought it, it was a simple thing, like, when it came to, like, an action man. Like, yeah. you naturally have more of an attraction without knowing you're thinking that you have an attraction. Mm. Do, you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Like, you gravitated yeah, in a, a different there's way. There's a picture of me in the bath. You know when you're younger and you, like, you, your friends come over and you have group baths? I don't know if that's a yeah. thing that you yeah. did, but we definitely did that. There's a picture of... My mum took it, and it was me, my sister, my sister's best friend and my best friend all in the bath together. They're all smiling at the camera... And I'm holding the action man going, <laughs> um, I'm going to try and find the picture because I need to show you it. But yeah, I'm just like staring at the action man like, nice. And I do think that's like very true. Yeah. I gravitated more towards Barbies because I loved playing with Barbies. And it's a way that I could play with my sister because she said like, if you want to play with me, you have to wear dresses and you have to play with yeah. Barbies. That was the same as me. Because we've both got older sisters and I think that's just... That they were the terms and conditions yeah. with playing. I mean, I didn't mind. I had a great time. No. I think you realise from a young age, but I don't think, like I said, I don't think you put two and two together. I, yeah. I don't think you're in that that mature mindset to mm -hmm. have that realisation yet yeah. of, ah, oh, I might be gay, like, yeah. or and I, I might be attracted to men in a more intimate way, yeah. you know? I also think I fought it a lot. Like, throughout secondary school, I definitely think I was discovering and realising it more. Um, but I didn't want to discover and realise that mm -hmm. part of me. So I would like suppress it or try and hide it. Or if someone said it to me, I'd get angry and be like, no, like that's not me. But at the same time, I think nowadays, if I've probably gone to school now, mm -hmm. I left school 10 years ago. So if I went back to school now in like this day and age, I feel like I might be more comfortable yeah. to be myself in school. I always worried about coming out because I thought that there would be a lot of judgment and a lot of hate. Um, I was always scared of what family would say or what friends would say if I'd lose friends or family or anything like that. We all have that same feeling inside of us. I mm. mean, e even with us both having the most accepting parents yeah. that we could ever wish for, in the back of your head you're always thinking, 
am I going to be judged? Like when I came out to my parents, I literally couldn't get the words out. I had to write it down on a notes page on my phone. Um, and I text the notes page to one of my friends and I said, can you just proofread this to make sure that there's no spelling mistakes? And she was like, oh my God, thank you so much for telling me. Please like tell your mum, tell your dad, mm. tell your sister. And then when I got round to doing that, I told my mum, I told my sister and my mum was like, right, I think we should tell your dad. And I was like, no, 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 we can't. Mm. But that's not because he wasn't an accepting or loving man. Like he is so accepting, he's so loving and he loves Reese unconditionally. But I think it's just the fear of the man in the family knowing that part about you. Yeah. I think I'd seen so many horror stories on soaps, on TV shows, on movies, and I thought, even in the news, and I thought, no, 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 I can't, I can't have that life for me. I, I don't want him mm. knowing. But they're probably the only people I ever came out to. And apart from that, friends and family and things like that, I think I, I didn't need to come out. I didn't no. want to come out. I just, whenever I had a boyfriend or anything like that, or if ever I was going to a gay club, um, if there were ever questions, I'd answer them then, but it was never a case of uh, you must come out. It was never, I was never told you must come out come to out, yeah. the rest of the family or to your friends or you must make a public statement because it was just never needed. No. I and I don't think agree. it is. How was the process to getting Hugo? It was quite a long process. Yeah. It took about two and a half years. Yeah. It was, it was a process, like... A very it, long process, a very we, emotional process. I didn't think we even in, even registered what we would have to go through. Or, Definitely not. I think we thought because we're putting it in the hands of science and it's physically... The embryo is being created, the embryo is then being transferred, it's just going to be... It's just going to yeah. work. Yeah. But that obviously wasn't the case in our situation. We were quite lucky. We, we found a surrogate... Um, we absolutely trusted her 100% and we went forward with it and it all happened fairly suddenly, I'd say. It felt like you were going through all these different appointments and screenings and things yeah. like that and then suddenly everything just clicked into place and just started yeah. happening. So we had created embryos and everything by probably nine months after our first appointment at the clinic. Mm -hmm. After all the screening and the tests and the everything basically. So we had these embryos created and we were ready to inseminate and then COVID hit. March of 2020, we all went into a lockdown and our appointment was two days after we went into this lockdown. Um, and our clinic had to call us and said, the governing board have basically said across the UK, all treatment is to be cancelled. Your surrogate's been taking her tablets, your surrogate's been doing this, you've been preparing yourself, we've got everything ready we just simply cannot go forward with this. And that was gut-wrenching in itself because we went from thinking that this was gonna be our year to being told that you're in a lockdown, you're locked in your house, you're not going to be starting that family that you thought you'd be having by the end of the year. Yeah. It was just a bit of an emotional roller coaster. Nick started opening back up in the, I think it was the July, was it? Did you I'm not too sure? I'm all I feel like anyway. I feel like it was the July of 2020. We had our first transfer. What they sort of do is the embryo is created, and then when they transfer the embryo, I believe you're technically about three weeks pregnant. I can't remember the exact yeah date. You know, you understood that a bit more better than I. So did. you're technically three weeks pregnant. So because usually in a natural conception way. Um, by time the sperm meets the egg and fertilizes and then gets to this blastocyst stage, it's about three weeks, I believe. Yeah. So technically the surrogate was three weeks pregnant already at transfer date. You then have to wait about a week or so um, and you have to go for a blood test. And the blood test determines whether or not the transfer has been successful. Yeah. So we got that phone call um, about a week or so later to basically tell us that the transfer was unsuccessful. I don't really remember much of the call because I took the phone call and pretty much collapsed on the floor. And I gave, think it was just a shock to it. I think you thought immediately all will be fine. Yeah. You'll be, we'll be pregnant. I think I just went in very naively and thought, I think we all this did. Is, this is to do with science. Like the science can just make yeah. it happen. They're putting an egg in, why would it yeah. not take? And then we had one egg left, one um, blastocyst embryo left in the freezer. We went again for round two when our surrogate was ready and able to. Had the transfer date and we got that call 
about a week or so later to tell us that it was successful and yeah. we were in fact pregnant and we were on our way to becoming fathers. Yeah, so we went for the tests and they basically would check yeah. whether the embryo was growing um, and how it was getting on. Um, and we went for the seven week scan and that was absolutely fine. With our clinic, we go for a 10 week scan. Yeah, before and then, they dismiss you yeah. off to the NHS. Yeah, so then they'll discharge us discharge, afterwards. Not dismiss. Yeah. We get discharged and then we get sent off to the NHS. So we went for this 10 week scan. Only one of us was allowed in, which was hard in itself. Reese sent me in because he was at work. So basically the doctor had told us that unfortunately um, the baby had stopped growing probably a week earlier and um, no longer had a heartbeat. We were basically told that this was probably due to something like um, a kidney, heart or liver problem. So in hindsight, we understand why this happened to us and mm -hmm. we understand the reasons for it. It still doesn't take away from the fact that you've just lost a child. Like, no matter what stage of that pregnancy you're in, mm. that's still a lot to go through. That's a, ba that's a, that's a baby that yeah. we'd never... You start we, planning we your life with that yeah, baby. We were told we've got a viable pregnancy so instantly you start planning things in your head, you yeah. start getting things in motion and and to be told obviously, oh sadly, you, you've lost your baby, like mm. oh, it's heartbreaking, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah. I don't think we've actually processed that, I feel like I've only pro processed parts of it still. Yeah, I think because we weren't, we didn't tell our friends or family how far into the process we were, we didn't tell them of each stage, we didn't tell anyone until we had a happy and healthy 12 week scan. Yeah. I think the fact that we then couldn't talk to people about it, we couldn't grieve properly, we couldn't understand yeah. it properly, we very much haven't fully grieved or understood that loss yet. Um, and I don't think we ever really will, to be fair. No. I don't think it's something that anyone ever gets over. Like, you still think, what would that baby have been? What where would they be now? What would our life be like now? We were told obviously to go home. We were told our surrogate would have to stop taking her medication and um, sort of like force a miscarriage um, yeah. because the medication she was taking was keeping the uh, baby there and was very much making her body think that she was pregnant. The surrogate stopped taking her medication and she did in fact start bleeding, um, but she was bleeding quite heavily. She ended up having to go to hospital um because of the hemorrhaging the hemorrhaging in itself like you worry for your surrogate but then equally you think you're the people that have put her in that situation mm -hmm. because you feel guilty yourself that someone is now in hospital because they're trying to make <laughs> your life a happier and better place yeah. you start it starts becoming so personal when yeah. you feel like you are at, at fault for, for doing that. Yeah, at no point did our surrogate blame us and at no point did she make us feel like we were at fault or anything. Mm. So the surrogate then came out of hospital um, and they said that by taking a tablet, her she should naturally pass the pregnancy um, because the pregnancy was very much still there. She was still bleeding two or three weeks later. So we ended up taking her back to our clinic and saying, listen, she's still bleeding. Can you just check her over because the hospital haven't even checked up on her. Um, they still haven't to this date. And they realised that, in fact, she hadn't miscarried at all and the baby was still very much there. Um, and she was so high risk for getting an infection. So she ended up having to go through a minor operation to remove the great. pregnancy and um, sort of get her body back to where it needed to be. Yeah. And then immediately after that, the surrogate was like, right, when can we go again? Which is just Incredible. amazing. We, we, we didn't anticipate that at all we genuinely thought okay probably we're probably done in in, yeah. in this in this story in this chapter for, for anyone to go through that that's got to be scary it's got to be triggering you've got yeah you've got to be some type of amazing woman to want to carry on with this journey for Definitely. another couple and she absolutely was that so at this point we were out of embryos in the freezer and we had to find a new egg donor and, and we had to create new embryos basically we then had that and created these new embryos and everything and we had the transfer in the April, I believe? March or April? I think it was the yeah. April. We had the transfer in the April of 2021 um, and that is how Hugo came along. And he is very much here. He mm -hmm. arrived at 36 weeks and he was in the NICU for a while um, because he had jaundice and obviously because he was premature. Yeah. But, I mean, he's a fighter. Oh my god, he's, he's almost a year old. He is huge. He is a chunky boy. 
How long do you think you'll wait until baby number two? We don't want to wait too long. I, mean, I said to someone the other day, I wish that I'd have a baby right now in my arms. Because we know how long it took yeah. to get to Hugo now, we're, we don't really want to put a time frame on something. I think when Hugo was born, I was like, I want an 18 month age gap. But if we wanted that, we probably should have got pregnant two months ago. So it's not possible. <laughs> There's no like time limit we have on it but equally we don't want to wait forever. But it is just such a process. Our first surrogate, she isn't able to do it this time round for us. Um, although she wanted to, mm -hmm. she's not able to for medical reasons. Um, so it's just something that it's gonna take some time, but we're not putting pressure on ourselves. No. We're happy that we have Hugo. And even if Hugo is the only child we're ever gonna have in life, we're so we're fortunate happy. and we're so happy. Yeah, we would want a child soon, but there's not a lot you can do wait. about it because unfortunately, no matter how many times me and Reese try, we just don't fall pregnant. <laughs> so what would you say the best and worst things about parenthood are? My best thing for me is, I'd say it's been actually having this whole year off because I've mm. seen Hugo grow every single day. Yeah, because um, you've been it, the stay at home dad, you've been on paternity leave for the year. I've, I've seen him transition in every single way yeah. to who he is now. Yeah. And that is incredible anyway. I'd love yeah. to be a stay at home parent. No, I need to go back to work. We're in an energy crisis uh, race. Um, We're about to go into a recession. It's not possible. <laughs> the worst thing we found more recently, actually, especially because it's coming up to winter, is I just hate seeing him ill. Like, that yeah. is the worst thing as a parent mm. is just seeing your child unwell. Like, yeah. no one wants that. You're constantly panicking and worrying if they have oh a temperature. God. You're constantly There's Googling so many things everything, that could happen. Like, what's wrong? Yeah. Um, honestly, Dr. Google, the worst thing to ever be invented. The worst thing. I think for me, the worst thing about being a parent is teething. Uh, because there's, there's literally nothing you can do. And they can't tell you their teeth are hurting. And all of a sudden they're just yelping and crying and then you wake up the next day and they're like this. With like loads of like funny gappy teeth coming out. Apparently, Invisalign isn't a thing for babies, but it so should be, because at the Stop moment... It. He, no, Hugo's mouth at the moment he looks, looks like, like a pumpkin. He no, doesn't. he doesn't even look like a pumpkin. You know, like in those cartoons where a piano falls on, like, Tom and Jerry's head? Oh, stop And then it. it's Tom, not that bad. Tom jumps out the top and smiles, and then he's got all these, like, piano keys hanging out of his mouth. It's not that bad. It's not the best. I say the worst thing about it is teething, just because of... He wakes up with sleepless nights and just the noises. Not the fact that his teeth look busted. That's absolutely not it. It's just like all the stuff that comes along with teething. The best thing is, I think I just love seeing how he interacts with everyone. He's such an inquisitive child. Like he just, he'll sit and, we, when we go to play groups, he'll sit and watch people and he'll really take an interest and then he'll go and do it himself. Or someone walks in a room and he's, sort of a bit wary of them for the first few minutes and then all of a sudden they're his best friend yeah and i just love seeing how he loves people and loves learning from people and loves playing with people i honestly yeah. think that's just such a beautiful thing to see for those of you that don't know we are currently renovating a house um we're extending we put an offer in in february of 2021 and we got the house in june 2021 um we're still not in the house the building work only started like last week so yeah, this question is, who is going to make all the decisions on the house? Tom thinks it's me. me. <laughs> it's me. It's not. It is. It definitely isn't with the kitchen because you don't spend a second in there. No, but I've decided what the kitchen's going to look like. I do like your design. Yeah. But I, I'm very much on board with that design as well. Yeah, but, but I made the decision. What decision? The, 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 kitchen's, the kitchen's how I want it. Tom's made one decision about the kitchen and that's... Yeah, the but I'm going, to, color. I'm going to design everything else. Basically, people asked what sort of um, colour palette is the um, house going to be. So, Reese thinks it's going to be neutral. It will be to a degree, but what I want is like neutral and then splashes of colour everywhere. Because I just think like... Yeah, I don't think you want a bland house. No. You need a bit of colour. You need yeah. a few little pops. See, so again, I've made the decision because last you week when I said... The decision. I have, when it comes to the house, I'm going to be making the decisions and Reese is going to pretend that it's him that did it. That's what we're this going to do. This is what happens. I put my views across, Reese puts his across, and then we compromise and we go with mine. <laughs> <laughs> what are Hugo's first birthday plans? Well, I have a list on my phone, um, and I don't think I've even this told you about I, this list. I'm not going to lie, I, let, I give Tom... 
free reign when it comes to events. I plan. I like planning. I like yeah, parties. That is just not me. A whole list on my phone of every theme for Hugo's birthday until the age of five. And then if we have baby number two, they also have themes. Hugo's first birthday party, because it's in winter, um, is going to be a winter one de land. You see where I'm going with this? All like snowy vibes, very, very extra. Yeah. I love extra. Hugo's Winter Wonderland, and it's just gonna be epic. Mm. We've got a special guest coming that is going to <laughs> hand out gifts, if you know what I mean. I'm excited for it. We we love a party, don't we, Reese? We do, we do. Love, yeah. We do love an event, we yeah. do love a party. So we have gone all out for his first birthday party because, I mean, it's a celebration, isn't it? You're only one once. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? And he's gonna um, remember every single second of yeah, it. Yeah, he's gonna know all about it, obviously. <laughs> what we're gonna do is obviously, we're gonna take you guys along with us because it's only two weeks away. Yeah, um, and not, I'm sure we will film all of the build up to it and how we decorate and what we do. Yeah, we're super excited about that. Mm. So guys, thank you so much for watching our first ever YouTube video. Um, it's taken a while to get Reese on board with YouTube, hasn't it? It, has. it really has. It has. Um, but we're here, and we're we're here to stay, aren't we, Reese? I've enjoyed it. I'm not going to lie. We're going to be doing it. like weekly vlogs. We're going to be doing like trips to London together. We're going to be doing Christmas visits. We're going to be doing Hugo's birthday. We're going to do everything. Everything. We're going to have so much fun, and you guys get to come with us. Be sure to subscribe. Be sure to like our videos. What else do YouTubers say at the end of a video? Um, like, subscribe, comment, share, and see you later. <laughs> see you later.